Welcome, I'm John Caldera, president of the, of the, you know, the Independence Institute and your devil's advocate. Later on, we're going to talk about, well, the ponies. Uh, just trust me on that one. First, of course, the delicate topic, sexual harassment at the state capitol. Who else to talk about it but our friend and lawyer, Jessica Peck. Thank Hi. you for being here. All right, Thank you. we probably ought to let folks know that the woman who started all these stories, Benda Berkman from KUNC, did a great job. She was going to be with us today, but she had to go off and cover a press conference, so we'll pretend that she's still here. But she broke these stories of two uh, Republicans, two Democrats, in sexual harassment. Um, I'm reading the stories, I'm trying to understand what they are. But it's not like it's a huge surprise given the culture at the Capitol. Am I off on this? It's truly a bipartisan commitment. Whatever we call this nonpartisan, transpartisan, it is everywhere. When you have a culture that is filled with people who are ambitious, like alcohol, care about the state, and want to rule the state, you are going to have a mess and clash of egos and a clash that inevitably leads to these right, allegations. So, so we're acting as if this is some sort of new thing at, at the Capitol. Right. This is not new. Uh, you've, as a lawyer, as an advocate, as someone who's been involved in politics, you've been around there a lot. It, it's a high school. It's a junior high school. You've got legislators who are from out of town, and so they spend the week here, uh, and they're away from, they're away from their families, they're away from uh, their communities, and there's a lot of drinking. Yeah, I mean, in a state like Colorado, a lot of uh, you know, the more rural lawmakers, they often get mocked for the size of their belt buckles. <laughs> but there's a reason why we call this Senate high. This is a state legislature that's filled with ambitious types like we saw with Cory Gardner or a lot of the more rural guys who sort of pride themselves on speaking their mind and saying what they think. So it really is a culture clash. I'm, I'm hearing the stories of after hours parties where legislators are drinking and lobbyists are there, guys are making really sloppy passes at women. Uh, and let's just say it, there's a lot of fooling around that goes on at the Capitol between legislators, between legislators and aides, between legislators and lobbyists. Mm -hmm. So were you surprised by any of these revelations? Well, what outrages me, and I say this as somebody who's down at the Capitol regularly for close to a decade, is that it took so long for people to get outraged. And that still today, in spite of all of this outrage, we still can't distinguish between what is two consenting adults, a lobbyist or a journalist right. and a lawmaker doing whatever they're going to do after hours, and a real situation with real victims. And I have represented a real victim. And I saw the establishment do nothing. This was probably five years ago. Let's, let's, let's go into that one. Sure. So you also represent women who have gone through this. What happened to your client as best you can? I had a, a lobbyist client. She worked with naturopathic medicine, and she was invited to an event downtown uh, which hosted state legislators. She was invited to a lawmaker's uh, hotel room at the Hyatt, very similar now to what we hear about Weinstein, and she was forced onto a bed. She said no. Uh, after a couple more passes, the lawmaker left. And so we reported that to House and Senate leadership. And the lawmaker, after a thorough investigation, a confidential investigation, the lawmaker was sentenced to sensitivity training. And that's all that happened. You compare that to what is happening now, where we are talking about forcing lawmakers out a week or even days or minutes after an allegation is made. I think we do need to have due process. And I don't like to live in a world where Twitter, Twitter is how we right. evict lawmakers. Right. Some of this is how much of it is sexual harassment, how much of it is an unwanted sexual advance, how do you draw the line, where does it become an unethical when it's at the Capitol because there are lawmakers with lobbyists and lawmakers among themselves, or is there sex for votes? I wouldn't be surprised. These people are peers, they're educated, they're powerful, and so there's a lot of peer-on-peer contact and insinuation, and that's part of the good old boys network. Where I draw the line is when, in good faith, a, lo a lobbyist or maybe it's even a citizen activist is put in a position by a lawmaker or somebody in power where that person's more in a subordinate role and suddenly they are being taken advantage of. That's the scenario where you have the Monica Lewinsky 
or uh, you have a staffer who walks in with a lawmaker flashing her. Um, I worked on another mm. investigation with a lawmaker you, you, who was a flasher here in Colorado. Really? Mike Garcia. He resigned. He was the 25-year-old wonder kid. And there were three separate women who came to me and said, we've got a flasher. That's a problem. At, at the Capitol? At the Capitol. And it happened at the Capitol? Yeah, it happened after hours. After at hours. The, at billiard halls and, right. balls and the, or, I'm sorry, bars surrounding the Capitol. This is nothing new. I've talked to nothing women new. who were lobbyists in the 80s who have said, are you kidding me? This, this happened even more back then. Well, it was more of a good old boys club. Um, and it, it was, it's just known. And it's no different in any other state legislature. It's no different in Washington, D.C. Uh, and the allegations are gonna, are gonna keep coming. Uh, help, help me with this, because you've been, you've been involved in, in cases like this. Where is the line? And this is what I mean. People are, are, are going to an after-hours cocktail party, and that happens every night at the legislature. Right. And I understand that. It's stressful. People are blowing off steam, and a lot of work actually gets done over, over a few beers. And someone's flirtatious, and someone then makes a really bad pass. Um, I'll even I'll use uh, Rosenthal's example that I read, um, which is he put his hand on another man's thigh and his backside and tried to, to kiss him. Is that sexual harassment? I think there's a question of proximity in terms of time. Maybe I'm not a feminist, but I have a real problem with women or men, whoever it is, the victim coming out years later and refusing to use a name. If you're going to take somebody down, own it, use your name. This is 2017. People can call me if they're scared wait, to come out, wait, right? Wait, wait, stop there for a second. Are you saying there was a time when women shouldn't have come out publicly but done this as, uh, as anonymous, and now's the time where they need to come out and say, here's my name, here's exactly what happened, and I'm not waiting 20 years? I'm saying that women of the past, including Hillary Clinton, failed the women of today. It shouldn't be only in 2017 that women are coming forward, or men. Uh, there are a lot of male victims out there, too. It should have been when Hillary Clinton kicked uh, Bill Clinton's ass to the curb at 1600 Pennsylvania, and we know that didn't happen. So we've had a delay in our culture shift, and this is not left versus right, conservative versus liberal. This is about women, so-called feminists, who failed my generation of women today, who now suddenly feel that they can speak out. Well, these well, women should have been speaking out long what, ago. What was a failure? The failure was that these women, like Hillary Clinton, shamed so many victims into silence, thinking they couldn't stand on their own two feet. And it shouldn't have taken this long for this to happen. And it, the unfortunate part of all of this, too, is that there's going to be a lot of innocent people that go down, or people who just make the bad pass. There's a lot of bad passes down at the Capitol. A lot of bad bills, a lot of bad passes. <laughs> a lot of bad passes, a and lot we, of bad bills. We need to understand and a lot that. of bad drinking, too. A so lot of bad drinking. This is. And part of it is natural human interactions. A lot of it is boys being boys, girls being boys, the tension between the two, the flirtation, the jokes that happen at, at the legislature, uh, they can be pretty raunchy, almost like what happens at hospitals and IUCs. If you talk to somebody who's a doctor in a stressful situation, they've got the most gross sense of humor, and it's how they deal with, with the pressure. I, I think there's a lot of humor down there that is going to be hurt because now there's going to be a sense of, I can't even say that. I think you talked about drawing the line and where do we draw that. When I went to House leadership five or six years ago representing a woman who was a victim of sexual assault, I had a, house, a member of House leadership make a pass at me as I'm talking to him about a member who is accused of sexual harassment. This member of the House leadership was an attorney who specialized in sexual harassment. That's a problem, right? On the so other what, side... What did, well, let me ask you, what did you do with that? I ignored it. Right. And I thought I was going to see the bigger picture of my client. I probably would have made the same decision today. I'm not victimized by a sloppy lawmaker who's making a really bad decision. But I'm quite certain that I wasn't the only one. Right. But there is a difference between any man making a pass at you, doing it poorly, and you rejecting him and going, no. That, for me, that's one line. If he continues after that, for me, that falls into the sexual harassment category, especially if it's somebody in leadership in Right, in and, the and people need to speak up and say, this isn't okay. And my concern is that I, one of the things I love most about the culture of politics, maybe this is perverse, but it's just the free-flowing, 
candor and the humor of that culture. And now people are going to walk around on pins and needles. I think in time we'll forget alcohol as a way of doing that to this culture of politics. And we're going to be back here in five or six years having the same conversation. And I, I think about some of the best dirty jokes I've heard down at the Capitol. They came out of women's mouths, not guys' yeah, mouths. Yeah, and I, mean, I it, think, it's, am I guilty uh, of sexual harassment? I don't know what the technical definition is, but I'm pretty sure that I have engaged in some level of sexual harassment. And I want to thank you for that. Yes. I, I, I appreciated it. I needed the attention. I mean, even jokes like that, will we be able to do them yes. come the next session? Will we be able to do them in workplaces? As I, long as I don't work for you. That's the difference. That's, or I should say you work for me, right? right? So that's the difference. It's when somebody's in a subordinate role. And if I were to teach sexual harassment training, I would say keep the free speech flowing, but you can't do it in a place where somebody is getting a paycheck from you or somebody's you depending the, on you. You can't even do the humor. Now, let, let me let me be clear. The Independence Institute is a really irreverent place. You've yes, known that. You've I have a with T-shirt us. that says "I got bitch slapped by John Caldera" when there was a prior <laughs> uh, prior attempt to boycott your show because right. you are the sexual harasser. Because I used the term I, "bitch slap" once. That's I right. wish I'm here to I say forgot that, all about that not once, not once have you ever sexually harassed me. I'm disappointed about it, but in all seriousness, if I were in a subordinate role and you were sexually harassing me, that would be wrong. I see us as peers, and so that's part of what I makes mean, it okay. Patty Calhoun has that T-shirt too. She does have that. She T-shirt. does. It was, there were, it was a limited run. It, it was, was a good limited stuff. run. But the humor there is—it's expected. There's a give and take, and there. I chose there, to wear that T-shirt, and right. it was men who led the boycott against you on behalf of women who weren't strong enough to stand up for themselves. That was the pitch. Right. And I think that that was what was so offensive about Those it. Those who might not know, it was um, uh, a liberal group who heard me say bitch slap on the radio, said, aha, he's a misogynist, let's go get him and see if we can get him. But you'd off. taken the term from Hillary Clinton. Yeah, but I, I, I took the term. It turned out that the people who were accusing me of being misogynistic, they themselves used the term in their own blogs. It was spectacular. It was That is hysterical. the great part about this. I mean, it truly is not a partisan issue. And if one start, side wants to start slinging mud, you go back far enough in every family, and you are going to find a harasser. All right. So Bill Gates, if he did not make a move at somebody at work, Melinda would not be his wife right now. Um, I know people who have hooked up with people at work and now they're married. And so this is going to be an issue. I've known people down at the legislature who... I met my ex-husband at the state capitol, as a matter of fact. So, I mean, right. people at the capitol, it's bred many healthy, happy marriages and maybe some that weren't so happy or healthy. But the point being, we, we as a species, we engage in relationships with those who are closest to us. All right, so the, there's a case between Lebsock and um, uh, Faith Winner, and it has political overtones in that uh, coming next year she'll be facing off against Beth Humanic for a, a state senate seat, which could be the state senate seat that decides whether it goes R or D, since it's only one vote difference. Uh, by her being brave and coming out about this, that's spectacular, that's strong, but there's part of me that says it's also rather convenient to put yourself in that situation and be able to tout yourself as, as the victim's advocate and the, the challenger, and it gives you an advantage next year. Dave Barry over at the uh, Aurora Sentinel wrote, wait a second, the person who should be under scrutiny here is the House Speaker, who's a woman, um, and that she hasn't responded to this. I, all of them should resign, he says, but he, she is responsible. What, what is the responsibility of leadership during all this? Well, the leadership is a responsibility to follow, follow the joint rules, which have a confidential complaint process. And Lebsack has a right to engage in that process. And my concern is how quickly all of this is going. And I put something on Facebook about it last night. And they said, well, he hasn't said anything. Or he says he doesn't remember. Therefore, he's guilty. That's not the way our courts run. And that's not the way the legislative process or uh, the investi any investigation by lawmakers should run. We need to give these things time. And we're in an era where people literally resign within 12 hours of something hitting the Twitter sphere. I don't want to live in that universe. And due process cannot flourish in that kind of world. 
Can we both agree that all these media elites falling from, from grace has a beneficial effect, that now women will be able to be stronger, not only to say no, but to, to um, come out publicly and do something about it. And also can we say, and I hope it's true, that we need to help our daughters, both of us have daughters, we wanna make sure that they protect themselves. I don't want my daughter having meetings in some guy's hotel room. I don't care how important he is. I'll teach my daughters to protect themselves and try and not put themselves in those situations. But also, I think we need to look at the culture and the time. The times, what we could say 10 years ago, we can't say today. So if we're talking about what Charlie Rose did in 1995 versus 2017, well, that's an important distinction to be made. And we've lost the era of the dirty old man. Oh, Matt just, Lauer is 59 years old. There is just, no space in the media elite anymore for the dirty old man, I for good or bad. I was just coming into my primey dirty old man years. Yes. Thank so. you so much. Hey, people want to get in contact with you, might need some legal help. Where do they go? They can go to my website, which is pecklawcolorado.com. Peck Jessica, thank you as always. Thank you. Stay tuned.